We live in a hub of higher education situated right on the water, so this seems like an obvious place to study marine science. Researchers with Northeastern University have been doing just that in the hunt since the 60s. But the Marine Science Center has gone largely under the radar. It's now undergoing much-needed renovations aimed at raising its profile and its impact. WGBH science editor Heather Goldstone has our story. A former military base at the far end of Nahant may seem an odd choice for a marine science campus, but for Jeff Trussell, it's an ideal spot. We have this marine lab, we have Boston, you know, world-class center of academia and, and um, intellectual creativity. Um, so let's, let's try and leverage that. The center is focusing on the challenges facing coastal cities, from sustainable fishing to managing the risks of climate change. When you look at things like the impacts of Hurricane Sandy and what that had on coastal ecosystems, uh, it's clear that this is a good area to focus. They're pouring millions into the facilities, and amid the construction, some critters have already moved in, including two rare blue lobsters. But the most notable addition might be Ocean Genome Legacy, an ambitious project to catalog the genetic material of every organism in the ocean. These genomes we can think of as a library, each one like a book describing that particular species in immense detail. Project director Dan Distel says the genetic library could hold recipes for new medicines, or in the case of his favorite, the shipworm, hint at more efficient ways to produce biofuels. Wood is, um, you know, it's a common material. And these organisms are able to break it down into its basic sugars. Once you have sugar, you can ferment that sugar into ethanol, and ethanol can be used for biofuel. Being partnered with Northeastern's marine researchers benefits ocean genome legacy. They're going out into the fields, they're collecting materials, and we're going to encourage them to deposit their materials in our collections. But there's an urgency to Distel's work, as human activities are driving mass extinction in the oceans. We're, we're watching the destruction of immense amounts of information that can be very valuable to us. Uh, we're watching that go away. So the idea of Ocean Genome Legacy is to try to capture some of that in the library. Ocean Genome Legacy is just getting started, but that's exactly the kind of collaboration Trussell hopes to foster. If we're really going to live sustainably with our environment, we really, really need to understand the interactions and dynamics of humans and the environment living together. A very big idea playing out on a small strip of sand in Boston Harbor. In a region that already has well-known marine labs, the thing that Northeastern is hoping will make it distinct is its focus on urban issues and its really, truly multi multidisciplinary approach. So, Heather, how are they going to go out about collecting all these organisms? I mean, there could be billions. I mean, how, how do they, well, how do they so know? Th they're thinking at this point that the best estimates are two to three million species in the ocean. and. Currently, they only have about 4,500 of those included in, in that. <laughs> yeah. So that was part of the impetus for the move to Northeastern uh -huh. is the fact that Ocean Genome Legacy has been on the campus of New England Biolabs uh, for the first several years of its existence and hasn't really had access to researchers that could go out and mm. collect for it. So they are hoping now that they're going to have more contact mm. with the academic community, and it's a collaboration. They're not doing it themselves. They're hoping researchers will go out, collect things, and bring them back to them. And uh, as you can see these pictures in the jars, what Ugh. they're hoping they'll get is uh, both whole organisms, which they keep around because, interestingly, it may turn out that in 10 or 50 years, somebody will be working with genetic information and say, well, this may not be the species we thought it was. And so mm -hmm. they can go back to these uh, whole samples uh, to, to verify that they're working with what they thought they were working with. So this used to be a military base. What does it look like? And by the way, who's paying for all this? <laughs> well, so in terms of paying for the renovations, they got $1.8 million in stimulus money that kind of jump-started things. And then since then, part of it's been paid for as they hire faculty. Mm -hmm. Those faculty help pay for the renovations of their new lab space and that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of the military base, it's really fascinating. Yeah, you get out there to the very tip of Nahant and built into the side of this hill are these two huge battery doors. It was actually uh, a World War II military site. Uh, it's, it's built to withstand a direct like hit. It's a bunker. Yeah. yeah, it's a bunker that's built to withstand a, a direct hit. And then apparently out on the very tip, there's actually a Nike missile silo that's been filled in. Wow. So I'm curious about those blue lobsters. I mean, <laughs> where did they come from? Did, how did they get those? Yeah. Well, so blue lobsters are a genetic variant of lobsters, and they're actually a, a bunch of different colors that lobsters can show up as opposed to that kind of mottled, dark, greenish, bluish that they typically are. Um, they estimate that blue lobsters are about one in two million. Um, some like calico or bright orange or white is the rarest. I've seen the white. Yeah, white could be as rare as one in 100 million. And there's actually some debate about whether or not uh, they're getting to be more common 
they would, you know, figure that these would stand yeah. out to predators more and, and be eaten more by predators. But as we've huh. overfished cod and other predators, maybe these are getting more common because Northeastern has two of them there. We've got one in Woods Hole. There's another, mm. I think, at the New England Aquarium. So Is the meat the same? They taste exactly the same. And they all turn red except for the white ones. They all turn red when cooked. What do they? What, what do the white ones turn? The white ones have absolutely no pigment, so they stay white. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is... Uh, is this going to be open to the public in any fashion there, there will all? be There will be a public component, and that's another thing that they're really hoping with their proximity to Boston, that they'll be able to draw the public in to learn more about the issues facing coastal cities and, and what ocean research can do to help with that. So, yeah, you'll be able to see the blue lobsters and some of their other stuff on public display, and they'll also be uh, interacting. And I've already started uh, some programs with local schools. All right. Heather Goldstone, thank you so much for that. My pleasure.